Today, 4012 Main Street in Flushing, New York is home to a mini mall that's known for shoes and clothing. 22 years ago, however, this address was a popular Wendy's where an extremely heinous crime took place. This crime would claim the lives of numerous individuals and traumatize the surviving victims for years to come. This is the story of the New York Wendy's Massacre. May 24th of 2000 was just another regular shift at Wendy's for Anita Smith in Flushing, a neighborhood in Queens, New York. The 22-year-old, who had goals of teaching children with autism in the future, was working the cash register on that day. She was on shift with her six other co-workers, 27-year-old Jean Auguste, who was the manager, 18-year-old Jaquan Johnson, 19-year-old Jeremy Mele, 23-year-old Patrizio Castro, 40-year-old Ali Ibadat, and 44-year-old Ramon Nazario. At around 11 p.m., Anita began to wrap up her shift and prepare to leave as it was closing time. She decided to stay a bit longer, however, so she could prepare the store for the next shift, as she would often do. Around the same time, two men walked into the store. One of them happened to be 36-year-old John B. Taylor, who was the former assistant manager at that Wendy's location. He had actually been the one to hire Anita about two years prior. He was accompanied by 30-year-old Craig Godineau, who worked with Taylor as a security guard at a clothing store. Soon after walking in, Taylor sparked up a conversation with manager Jean, which seemed to be friendly, although the two had problems while he was working there. Godineau and Taylor then placed their orders, which were quickly prepared by Jaquan Johnson, who was working the grill. The two men then received their food and went to sit down at separate tables to eat. After finishing his meal, Taylor got up and went to speak to Jean, who was now downstairs in the office. Godineau remained upstairs, conversing with Jaquan about rap stars they liked. Moments later, the Wendy's crew heard Jean over the intercom asking everyone to come down to the office for a meeting. This immediately stuck out to the crew, as it was a bit odd for Jean to call for a meeting at closing time. Nevertheless, they obliged. They all walked downstairs in a single-file line, with Godineau following closely behind. When they arrived downstairs, however, they would soon find out that there was no meeting taking place, but instead, something far more sinister. The crew was immediately confronted by Taylor, who had a gun in his hand. He instructs the employees to get down on the floor, where their hands were duct taped together and their mouths were covered by the two men. They were then led into the walk-in freezer a short distance away. Once in the freezer, the employees were made to get on their knees while Godineau put plastic bags over their heads. During this time, manager Jean attempted to escape from his bonds and removed the tape from his mouth, which angered Taylor greatly. Using his 380 handgun, he ended Jean's life. Hearing the altercation, Anita Smith begins screaming in panic, asking what happened. Taylor then turns the gun towards Anita and ends her life as well. At this point, Taylor hands the gun over to Godineau and instructs him to quote, finish them. Godineau proceeds to shoot Ramon Nazario, Patrizio Castro, Jeremy Mele, Ali Ibadat, and finally Jaquan Johnson. All were struck in the head at nearly point-blank range. Despite having just committed one of the most heinous crimes in New York City crime history, the two men then nonchalantly walked back upstairs and exited the premises, even locking the door behind them. Once outside, they separated into the night, taking public transportation to get home. Little did the perpetrators know, however, not everyone in the Wendy's crew had actually died. Shortly after the men left the building, Patrizio Castro regained consciousness and managed to wiggle his wrist free of the tape. He then proceeded to remove the bag from his head and ask everybody if they were okay. He got no response back, however. He also felt a weight on his knees, which he later discovered was the body of Ali Ibadat. Patrizio didn't know it at the time, but he had been shot in his right cheek, just below the ear. Moments later, Patrizio heard another sound. At first, he thought it was the perpetrators, but quickly realized that it was Jaquan Johnson, who had also survived. Castro later described that Jaquan, quote, looked like he had been punched or beaten, but was trying to smile through it. He was far more severely injured than Patrizio, however, so he had to be carried up the stairs. Patrizio then called 911 from the manager's office using a fax machine. Because the police station was only minutes away, they were able to quickly arrive to the store. Upon arriving, authorities would encounter the disturbing scene. 
What was even more disturbing to police, perhaps, was the fact that this heinous act was carried out for a mere $2,400, which was in the safe and cash register. Police quickly got to work, and due to the severity of this crime, left no stone unturned at the scene. With the help from surveillance footage, testimonies from the surviving crew members, and fingerprints left behind, police were able to identify John B. Taylor as the primary suspect within 48 hours. They also found out about his previous employment at that Wendy's and his extensive criminal background, which included numerous fast food robberies similar to this one. He had been regularly committing these robberies since 1996, doing numerous stints in prison. Wendy's offered a $50,000 reward for any information leading to Taylor's arrest, and the city put up $10,000. Less than 48 hours after the incident, police discovered that Taylor had been hiding at his sister's residence, located in Brentwood on Long Island. On May 26 of 2000, Taylor was apprehended by Suffolk County Police at the residence. On his person, they found the cash from the robbery and the same gun used during the crime. Upon apprehending Taylor, he would immediately out Godineau to police. He told authorities that Godineau was working at the clothing store at that time and they could easily arrest him. During the subsequent interrogation, he would continue to throw his accomplice under the bus, even going so far as to say that he did not shoot any of the victims and instead went upstairs while Godineau carried out the deed. He generally downplayed his role in the massacre, making Godineau out to be the mastermind. Taylor was also adamant that all he wanted to do was rob the place, and it was Godineau who wanted to quote, leave no witnesses, according to him. In a written 11-page statement, Taylor penned the whole crime on Godineau, who he had only known for one month at that time. Shortly after arresting Taylor, police apprehended Godineau as well, at the clothing store where Taylor said he would be working. Police quickly discovered that he too had a lengthy criminal history, with numerous charges of robberies and possession of illicit substances. He informed police about his involvement in the crime, however implicated Taylor as the true mastermind behind the devious plot. At this point, with the mounting evidence against the two, it was only a matter of who could convince the police that they were less culpable. On July 27th of 2000, John B. Taylor and Craig Godineau pleaded not guilty to their charges, totaling to 10 counts of murder in the first degree and 10 counts of murder in the second degree, among various other charges such as robbery and attempted murder. This was a rather peculiar move on their end, considering the two men had already made incriminating statements and confessed. With so much evidence available, Queens District Attorney Richard Brown was tasked with deciding whether or not to seek the death penalty in this case. In November of 2000, however, Godineau's lawyer, Colleen Brady, came out with the revelation that he was mentally deficient. Childhood testing put Godineau's IQ at roughly 70, and Colleen Brady argued that somebody in such a circumstance cannot legally be handed the death penalty. Godineau and his lawyer were also adamant that he was manipulated by Taylor, who knew it would be easy to take advantage of Godineau due to his mental deficiencies. They further stated that Godineau did not understand the gravity of the situation and that Taylor bribed him with $300 and a gold coin to carry out the vicious attack. On January 22, 2001, Craig Godineau would go on to plead guilty for his role in the murders, attempted murders, and other charges related. In February of that year, he would be sentenced to five consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. He was spared the death penalty due to his mental deficiencies. In court, however, District Attorney Richard Brown made it absolutely clear that he would still be seeking the death penalty for John B. Taylor. His case wouldn't be decided until November 26 of 2002 when he would be found guilty of murder and the jury would unanimously decide on the death penalty. Although Taylor was only charged with two counts of murder as opposed to the five that Godineau was charged with, prosecutors maintained throughout the trial that he was the true mastermind behind the plot and therefore should be punished to the maximum extent of the law. In 2004, however, New York once again outlawed the death penalty. The Queens District Attorney's Office fought to have Taylor's case declared an exception to this decision due to the severity of his crime, but they were unsuccessful. As a result, on October 23rd of 2007, New York's Court of Appeals vacated the death penalty portion of Taylor's verdict. Instead, he was resentenced to life without parole for the murders, where he remains to this day. In 2020, Craig Godineau, who had just turned 50, did an exclusive interview with popular New York TV station PIX11 News to speak about the crime. 
In it, he states that he did not fully understand the gravity of his situation when he was younger and that Taylor had completely taken advantage of him. He also stated that he regretted taking the plea deal because he couldn't comprehend the finality of this decision at the time. Here is that interview. He told him to come get me from Jamaica Avenue at CNR clothing store. An imposing security guard who had worked with Taylor for a month. I hit the manager, and once I hit the manager, John reached over and shot him. And once he reached over and shot him, he shot the female. That's when he told me to finish it. And I said, finish what? He was like, you gotta finish everybody. You gotta kill everybody. I told my mom, when I was young, I wanted to go to the Air Force, become a teacher or an artist, a music artist. Godino avoided a death sentence for Wendy's because childhood testing had put his IQ under 70. They didn't say I was mildly mentally but they said I had a learning disability and they said I couldn't keep up. And he saw me as a child and he influenced me to come with him. And I don't know why I didn't stop them. I don't know why. Do I remember their faces? Godino did prison stints for selling drugs and robbery and got paroled. He claims he didn't expect a mass shooting at Wendy's. We're wrestling for the gun. As we're wrestling for the gun, he picks it up and he cocks it back and he tells me if I hit him again, he's going to shoot me. So then that's when he told me to finish it. Godino says he didn't understand the finality of his guilty plea, five life terms without parole. I'm not accepting this. I don't want to be labeled a statistic with a DIN number on my shirt walking around like a lost soul in prison. Nobody wants to be labeled as that, labeled as cattle. Yet Godino says he regrets all the lives destroyed for a $2,400 payday. He gave me $300 and a gold coin. $300 for seven people shot. Yeah, yeah, I think about them. I said a prayer for them. I feel remorse. He further went on to recount a traumatic experience he had while he was younger, which he pegged as the reason for his troubled life. Godino told us when he was 10 years old, he suffered a trauma. He said he was approached by a young man near PS118 in Jamaica. My aunt told me to uh, go back to the school and get my uh, spelling words. And he asked me, did I want to make uh, $10? Do I want to help him clean up his uncle's room? His uncle's room for $10? So by me being a kid, I was like, I guess so. Godino said he was taken to a house near the old Sundu factory. I was like, assaulted by him. By him, he was like, I think he was like 18 years old, upstairs in the attic, in his attic, Miss Murphy, upstairs in his attic. Although it can be argued that Godineau couldn't receive the death sentence due to his mental deficiencies, many don't believe him to be as innocent as he makes himself out to be. While it may have been easier for Taylor to take advantage of him due to his situation, Godineau was a grown man who was already 30 at the time, with a child. He was not a young, impressionable individual who didn't know right from wrong. The fact that he was able to so casually spark up conversation with Jaquan, who he would later attempt to kill, just showcases how cold-blooded he was. He also had numerous opportunities to stop Taylor, but instead chose to be complacent. For this reason, many regard Godineau equally culpable for the vicious attack as Taylor was. In 2020, Jaquan Johnson would also give an exclusive interview to PIX11 News explaining his side of the story. Here is his interview. He ordered his food. I was like, oh, that's his boy, so I'm going to hook him up. Jaquan Johnson was just 18 then, working the grill. I'm trying to get some fresh air here, And for the first time, Johnson is publicly sharing details of what happened that night. I get a, a call on an intercom, which was Gene telling us to come downstairs. We having a meeting. The manager popped the tape off his hand pulled off his face and it was like started breathing funny like yo my asthma my asthma and then they beat him up put more duct tape on him and picked everybody up walked us in the freezer that's when they came in with plastic bags they tied it over the manager head first I was like oh they about to suffocate us everybody got down on their knees that's what he said everybody get on your knees and it basically was an execution. That's when they shot Jean. Uh, then Anita started screaming. They shot her. Like, I'm right next to Jeremy. When he got to me, he passed the gun to Craig. Craig take the gun. I'm thinking he gonna shoot me. Instead of shooting me, he go to the corner. He shoot Raymond, Patrick, Ali. 
and then me. I was the last one to get shot. The bullet went in right here and it went through, came through the nose, top of the mouth. That's where it came out? I hit this too. It felt like I got hit with a sludge hammer. And all I remember was Patrick um, shaking me like, yo, you all right, you all right. He was like, yo, you think you could make it up the stairs? Johnson couldn't walk. So Patrick Castro, who was barely grazed by the bullet to his head, carried him. Their five co-workers lay dead in the freezer. I still think about my friends all the time. And I got to live with that for the rest of my life. Jaquan suffered partial paralysis in the legs and experienced seizures for several months after the incident, but luckily was able to make a full physical recovery. The emotional anguish he suffered from this event, however, will stay with him for the rest of his life. After the vile crime which took place on May 24th of 2000, the Flushing Wendy's would never reopen its doors again. A vigil was held there where flowers, candles, cards, and notes to the lost loved ones were left for months after the incident. The 4012 Main Street location where the Wendy's once stood is now home to a small shopping outlet where numerous vendors sell their goods and services, completely oblivious to the disturbing events which had previously taken place there. Our deepest condolences to the family and friends of John Auguste, Anita Smith, Ramon Nazario, Jeremy Mele, and Ali Ibidat, who fell victim to the evil actions of two demented men.